uh, but first the flesh debate and the idea is that, that there will be arguments um, uh, in favor of uh, um, having intellectual property in terms of uh, patents um, and uh, arguments uh, against that uh, notion uh, and of course in light of open science and we've uh, invited for that uh, Rinza and uh, but also Mirko uh, uh, Lukacs who is from uh, the holding at uh, the UMC Utrecht holding and, and who knows a lot about uh, how to get your uh, uh, UMC work uh, into uh, um, a company. Uh, so yeah, with, with that, I would like to give uh, the, the floor to Rinza and, uh, and Mirko. And I would also invite you to, uh, after their uh, arguments, uh, engage in the, in the debate slash uh, discussion. Thank you, uh, Sander. Uh, yeah, so uh, Mirko is a senior business developer at the Utrecht Holdings, um, uh, which of course uh, all sounds very uh, commercial and closed. Uh, and the question for today is uh, slightly tongue in cheek, but um, um, uh, if, if science is uh, apparently uh, going to be open uh, with the aim of uh, increasing uh, societal impact, uh, why then do we still need uh, protection of uh, intellectual property? Um, of course, I can think of some arguments as well, but uh, I will give the floor now to, uh, to Mirko, who will explain the need for uh, IP protection. I will then follow up with some uh, counter arguments, and then we will invite you to, uh, to join this uh, flash debate. So uh, Mirko, why do we need protection in, in times of open science? Yeah, thank you, uh, Rinsen, and thank you for inviting us because uh, yeah, this topic, open science, but also intellectual property uh, is very important uh, for us also as the knowledge transfer office of Utrecht University and, uh, and the hospital. So we're happy to, to discuss that. Uh, and actually, we believe there is a positive relationship between IP and, uh, and open science. And I would like to illustrate that with four short uh, statements that I will discuss. Uh, first of all, we really see and believe that IP intellectual property rights, such as patents and copyrights, that IP can help increase societal impact. Um, because as we understand it, open science is really a uh, key objective for uh, creating more societal impact. Um, and uh, to create societal impact, uh, we see that if you just publish your uh, research in, in international journals, if you just discuss it on conferences, um, it often doesn't reach the patient. Uh, as, as Frank Miedema, uh, who you all know, and who we also know because he was uh, our supervisory board member of Utrecht Holdings for many years, he was always saying a publication does not heal a patient. And that's absolutely true because it takes much more for a new medical device, for a new drug to reach that patient. And what you need in many cases is a professional market party who can further develop it, validate it, test it, distribute it, market it. And that's a very costly and risky uh, endeavor. Um, and the thing is, those companies will only do that if they have some business case, if they can earn back their millions and sometimes billions of euros of investments. Um, so if you can say, Yes, you can get our IP. The IP has been protected by a patent or by copyrights. In case of software, for example, uh, this company will have a competitive advantage and has an incentive to further develop it and take the risks of investing a lot in it uh, to bring it to the market. That's our first point. The second point is that uh, we believe that patent filing is actually a way of open science. Uh, some of you may have followed our Selling Your Science course. And then you know that uh, to file a patent that requires open publication of the invention. 
so that everyone, researchers, scientists, but also companies can read it, can further study it, can further develop it if they, uh, if they like. The only thing that they cannot do is uh, commercialize uh, that patent invention uh, for 15, typically for 15 years. Uh, so that's the only restriction. Uh, and after 15 years, by the way, also the patent owner uh, is uh, obliged to, 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 to give the patent to everyone who wants to use that. So actually it's a method for sharing the invention with everyone with the only restriction non-commercializing it. And actually that's true for all non-patent IP at the university and the hospital. Uh, you cannot go to market with that without a license uh, from the university of, or, the, or the hospital. So you can see it as also a way of open science. Avant la lettre. Um, this, I think we, we discussed this at Utrecht Holdings. I told my colleagues who are also business developers and investment management, okay, we have this discussion going on about open science and the relationship with, uh, with IP. And um, uh, what they brought forward was that they absolutely believe that without patent protection, we now would not have effective and safe COVID-19 vaccines. Why not? Um, well, you all know that pharma companies like Pfizer, uh, Johnson, uh, uh, Modena, AstraZeneca, they have to invest a lot uh, to develop such a new vaccine. That takes normally uh, many years. They, they now did it very fast, but it is very, very costly and risky. Uh, it's very costly because it's simply a, a very intensive process, high technological, uh, and it's very risky because, you know, uh, 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 sometimes these drug developments fail. In many cases, they do fail in terms of use and market uh, safety. Um, so you can only afford to do this research and development as a company if you have some protection. If you know that when I come up with this drug, I'm at that point of time the only one who can go to market uh, uh, with it. And, uh, and then you can build a business case on that. And we live in a Western democracy. We live in an open society. And this open society in Europe, the United States, has chosen to leave drug development not to the state, but to private companies. Um, so if you would say, okay, we don't like that idea. We don't like that, 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 that commerce is, 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 is mingling with our drugs. Uh, I mean, that's an interesting statement. Uh, but then the alternative that you should say, okay, it should be a state funded responsibility. And then the question is, and Rinsa, I would be very interesting if you can maybe uh, 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 argue that. Do you think in that case, governments would be able uh, to, to produce such a safe vaccine in such a short time as we, need, we now see, for example, with Pfizer, uh, that only just costs 20 euro for one patient. So I would be interested if you can see that as uh, maybe a realistic alternative. That would be very nice. Okay, my final point. Uh, we're not only dealing with patents, uh, we are all, not only dealing with biotech and medtech, we also deal with a lot of uh, digital innovations in areas such as learning, e-health, uh, artificial intelligence. I do it myself, I do a lot of uh, e-health and e-learning uh, uh, commercialization and licenses and startups and spin off And um, as we understand it, the open science, science Policy is also saying, okay, if you have academic software, it should be open source. Okay, that makes sense in many cases, but it does not help always to create impact. And there's the same argument. Uh, and I can see that with a lot of the startups we have in Utrecht, for example, at Utrecht Inc, 
going to the market with great inventions from the hospital and the university. A lot of them are ICT uh, based. They won't build a startup if they do not own the IP because you won't have the competitive uh, advantage. So there's the same argument. There is no incentive for a company, uh, for a licensee, uh, to invest in further developing and marketing it because that's a huge step from, from the research to the, to the market. And the, yeah, as you know, the famous valley of death in between is, is, is huge. So those are some of our four uh, arguments to say, okay, open science and open source is great. It's uh, in, in many cases, I would say in almost all cases, beneficial for science but it is not in all cases beneficial for societal uh, impact. So I would like to leave it there for uh, an open discussion. Okay, Mirko, uh, thank you uh, very much indeed. Um, yeah, nice of you to, uh, to make the bridge to, uh, to the current pandemic and, uh, and the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, let me uh, uh, in indeed respond. Um, I'm going to share my slide because of my screen. Um, as of course, there is uh, a big debate uh, currently going on. Uh, uh, as you all probably are aware that uh, a lot of countries and people are calling for a temporary waiver of patents uh, on uh, COVID-19 vaccines um, as to better distribute the, uh, yeah, the possibilities of, of uh, vaccination and also manufacturing the vaccine um, and the question of course is how then is this legitimized in terms of, of property rights uh, haven't, haven't these pharmaceutical companies uh, developed these very expensive vaccine on their own and how could we uh, legitimize um, uh, now temporarily um, uh, waiving such a, a patent well the biggest argument here uh, I, I think is that patents effectively privatize public investment. Yeah? So typically these pharmaceutical companies are, are building on sometimes decades of uh, public investment in research. Yeah? And, and of course calculations differ, but um, uh, for the US it has been calculated uh, that about two thirds um, uh, of, of spending uh, in biomedical research uh, comes from the government uh, where the pharmaceutical companies typically only cover the last part and then patent uh, some part of which which can be uh, commercialized um, and uh, when you come to think about it that way you can say okay well maybe it is a pandemic and and uh, and where we need a very fast response um, is, is not uh, very compatible with a long-term uh, protection of IP uh, through patents um, because it's uh, indeed the question of whether this uh, really um, uh, gives, gives the best results. Um, if we, uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, and there is a, an interesting historic precedent from the 1940s. I know it's, it's a long way back, but um, <laughs> um, Oxford University had then recently uh, discovered uh, how to isolate vitamin D. Uh, this was commercialized by American universities and they were a little upset about this um, as um, yeah, they thought, okay, vitamin D is of vital public health importance and now it's it turned into a commercial product. So when they discovered penicillin uh, in the midst of uh, you know, running up to the second world war, uh, everybody wanted of course to scale up this production. Uh, and Oxford University abstained from patenting uh, anything regarding uh, production for penicillin. And the entire production and scaling up and manufacturing of penicillin uh, was then coordinated by the War Production Board, who brought uh, all pharmaceutical companies and, and other actors together. Uh, and they, um, on the condition that there was a free exchange of knowledge, uh, because of course the argument went, okay, we now have this very potent drug. We have hundreds of thousands of soldiers needing it. Um, we can't use uh, long-term patent protection now where we now have to create this uh, drug as soon as possible. Um, and so that this goes to show that in times of, in this case, war uh, and maybe even a pandemic, um, patents may not be the best way to, to stimulate innovation. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. 
Uh, and another one is um, you talk about incentives. Uh, you say, well, uh, we need uh, protection. Uh, Long-term pr protection uh, is, is an incentive for a pharmaceutical company to invest in research uh, so as he can uh, earn back his investments. Um, but of course, there are other ways to stimulate investment. Eh? So there are the, the, the more or less famous X prizes, uh, where sometimes tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars are awarded for uh, certain breakthroughs, um, eh, which are done, of, of course, uh, more or less free. Um, eh, but it goes to show that you can also, uh, with a one-time reimbursement, stimulate innovation. And this is also uh, the, the plea of two... Uh, uh, health economics uh, economists in NSA who say, well, uh, don't waive patents, but just uh, buy them from pharmaceuticals, uh, which is, of course, a, a sort of middle way. Uh, but it illustrates, okay, well, maybe we can just um, uh, reward, indeed, the investment and the innovation, uh, but don't protect it uh, for so long um, uh, as to, well, maximize the, the impact. Um, and the other uh, question is, uh, okay, are there then examples of, of uh, people or universities doing it differently? Well, this is one example, Aarhus University in uh, Denmark, um, where they have this uh, yeah, open discovery innovation network, but it's, it's a, it's a uh, collaborative research between a uh, university and a range of companies in which they agree to collaborate and to uh, don't patent anything they find in, in those research projects uh, because they believe uh, patents can be uh, hampering as well. Uh, sometimes it, uh, it, it blocks a collaboration because you don't want to share information and here they agree to, to collaborate because uh, they believe it's beneficial for both sides to, to have a, a, an, open, an open phase uh, in this uh, innovation. And, um, so these were my uh, talking points. Um, yeah, maybe Merkel wants to respond. I'm also curious as to if there's anyone from the audience who wants to weigh in, uh, anyone who maybe has patented something his or herself or published something and regretted it. Uh, I know Geert Bostekamp has some famous examples uh, about that. Otherwise, I'll give a first uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe first reaction on, uh, on yeah. my side. Uh, I, I like the point uh, you you are making about the uh, uh, the good sense of uh, uh, wavering uh, patents in such extreme conditions like war, like this this pandemic, Joe Biden, U.S. Uh, administration now uh, wants to do that and i think that absolutely makes sense in such extreme conditions um, uh, but that is kind of an exception and i, I think and also what you're saying okay there are these uh, reimbursements one-time reimbursement i think those are all examples of you know which might be very useful and beneficial in some circumstances but we should look at open science and we should look at uh, IP and we should look at, uh, at uh, academic research from a broader uh, uh, long-term perspective. And you should wonder, you know, if you would uh, not protect uh, these kinds of inventions with, with, with patents, uh, with, with IP, would this system work better than without it. And there's one more aspect, and I don't know if our director Tessa is already online, because she can, uh, she, she has a pharma background and she can better argue that than I. But another point is that the system that we have, it, had pro, it has pros and cons of patent protection, but it also regulates drug development, which is very, very important. As we all know, we have seen the discussions about is AstraZeneca safe or not? It's in the public interest that we make very safe vaccines. That requires a lot of technology, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of uh, 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 companies that actually invest in that. But maybe Tessa, I see that you're online. Maybe you would like to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Mirko, and um, good day to everybody. Uh, yeah, maybe introduce yourself uh, a bit. Uh, <laughs> So my, my name is Tessa Scheringhauser. I work as a director of our KTO office in Utrecht. Um, 
I indeed have experience with the pharmaceutical industry for over 15 years, and I mainly was responsible for pricing strategies across Europe. And I think the whole patent uh, related discussion, it's not new uh, for pharma. This has been a discussion which has been going on for years. Um, with the, I think the, the motivation and the drive for raising the topic usually has been pricing, right? Um, because a patent, although it's a protect to invest strategy and it's a regulated market, uh, it, it, it gives you the, uh, and, and, and sometimes that's demonstrated as well, that prices are sky high and that those are protected by patents as well, right? So there's this um, idea of monopoly situation uh, for the pharmaceutical industry. Today, we see there's multiple vaccines that came to the market uh, more or less in parallel, not in series, not after the one patent uh, um, was uh, ended and a new one could be started. So there's multiple examples that patent regulation is developing as well. So um, it's harder and harder for pharmaceutical industry to have this monopoly position and it's um, enhancing competition and pricing uh, competition as well amongst pharma industry. What, what I think is important to mention in this discussion as well is that the belief is that open science and no patenting and no protection uh, would provide a uh, bigger market access, right? Um, more customers to be reached, uh, which I not completely consider a clear um, 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 uh, relation as um, for patent protection, you protect a particular product, right? And it's, it is very transparent uh, what a customer is paying for. Uh, it's paying for a product and it's paying for a product that uh, has a particular business model. With open science, it, it tends to give you the perception that everything is for free, but there's nothing for free in this world, right? So uh, we have to be very clear that there is a different business model behind that. And we've seen with, uh, and that's in software business as well, I think evident. Uh, and we also see those data leak leakages, but we also see there's a business model behind uh, open science uh, where the behavioral data is being sold business to business. And that's not, that's not totally transparent uh, to the customer. So it's not a pricing issue, it's a privacy issue, which then uh, has to be dealt with. And for me, um, it's, yeah, as a customer, I would say I'd rather have certainties and know who I'm dealing with and have a clear business model instead of all those not regulated, not transparent issues, which could occur with open science. Okay, but okay. Um, that's, uh, it's not always the case. Like there is a, a gray line uh, between patented and open science. And sometimes you will have a domain where open science is most beneficial. And we should, you know, we should encourage that. But we also should see that in, in, there's a lot of cases as well where patent uh, protection uh, should be applied for the best market dynamics and the best faith and trust of customers in the products. Yeah, because uh, to, to come back to Mirko's point, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, I don't want to redo the entire debate about uh, <laughs> drug prices, but um, and my question would be: is, is is are patents really the only incentives for for innovation? Yeah? Uh, no. Can't we think of no. other models? Yeah, yeah, there because, are many. Because... There are many. Just one of them. Uh, uh, if you talk about. Uh, incentives but uh, it's it, it's it's the, the system we've chosen that the governments are saying okay we are not we are not into uh, state-funded uh, drug development we leave it to companies yeah then you have to uh, accept that these companies want some competitive advantage and that competitive advantage comes with ip uh, that that's yeah th those are the market dynamics uh, so uh, what i would argue yes there are some alternative models and there are also other incentives also maybe to make some business models without uh, uh, patents yeah, you see that in software 
that uh, you don't need patents, for example, to go to market with software. Uh, but it's really a, a systemic thing that we say drug development, we leave that to companies. We've chosen that. And you should also question yourself, yeah, would the state be more efficient than what we have now? Would that lead to better, more? No, I, I don't drugs? think so. And no. that, that's, I think, the essential question that you have to balance. Yeah. And Rinsen, no, but I, is it, I, I is don't it think the right it's question either. to be asked, Rinsen? Is it is a patent a means for innovation? Is that the right question to ask? I mean, the innovation is driven by a customer need, and I think uh, you should choose a system in which you will reach as many customers and have the biggest societal impact. And maybe that's with a patent because you have protect to invest and you have high quality and you have a clear business model. If that's open science, because you have another route to, you know, to reach customers and to have a societal impact, then you should take another route. Yeah. I don't think the question should be that a patent is a means to innovation. Um, all right. Yeah, and, and, and to come back to Mirko's point, I, I'm not really arguing for um, state-run laboratories to, to develop drugs, but uh, I, I do think in the uh, patent system is yeah has grown too complex yeah, and gives pharmaceutical companies uh, a little too many advantages. Uh, of course, they are well described. Uh, there is a lot of rent seeking litigation. Yeah. There are submarine patents. Uh, there are patent wars. Um, many patents, by the way, never are used. Um, and so, so there's a lot of criticism on, uh, on the patent, patent system, system of course, yeah, yeah, which is not the same, same as advocating um, yeah. state-sponsored laboratories to yeah. Drugs. yeah yeah I, <laughs> I, I agree with that actually Rinse. Uh, of course uh, the patent system is from the industrial age uh, the world has changed a lot so it is always good to reconsider uh, the uh, the foundations of why uh, do we have this this patent uh, system and uh, I think also patents, like many other things, also legislation in many areas, privacy, all those things, they, uh, you know, they are up for, for open uh, discussion and, and sometimes for improvement. So I absolutely believe uh, that we should rediscuss some of these mechanisms and that we may come up with some uh, more, uh, mod uh, more modern uh, models, uh, uh, but that's that, that's always the case. So, so uh, with that, I, I would like I would like to uh, if, if there's someone still, oh, I see Gerard. Uh, maybe one final point, Gerard. You have to put on your mic. Yeah, I think it's interesting to cut this question, but if I would peel it a little bit off. Uh, to do something we're confronted uh, with as, as researchers is that a patent is something that you say, yeah, I really want to do. If you write a patent for as a researcher, you want to do something with it. You want to sell it, you want to license it, or you want to build up a company, startup company. But in the majority of cases, we're not, uh, let's say, struggling with a patent, but with something that is sharing of, of, of knowledge uh, ownership. If we have a contract with an industry and there's always a paragraph who owns the knowledge and we send it to the legal department and you say, yeah, we have to really protect our knowledge. Well, I don't have any intention to write a patent whatsoever. So, and these are the things we could do something about to change it and say, if the company we're working with has all the knowledge to valorize, let's say, the knowledge we create, but we get money for our research, and that's what we do as an academic center. Is that not a possibility that we lower the bars for, uh, let's say, uh, that we don't want to protect with everything we got uh, our knowledge while we know we're not going to do anything with that knowledge? Because then it, we get more interest for the companies to collaborate with us. So we stimulate collaboration. The knowledge is not thrown away. It's used in the community, but not by us, but by the company. So I think that's something that we can work on. So that we lower the bars with our legal offices and not be so stringent on protecting our knowledge while we know we're going to do nothing with it. Thank you. 
Yeah, so um, if, if I may make a final uh, or give sort of final thought, and then uh, Rinsu wanted to uh, to also say something. Uh, I guess I agree with the with the notion that that uh, that there should be um, uh, we should rewrite maybe some parts of the 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 laws and, and regulations because of course there are some extremes, right? We all know the discussion about diabetes medicine in, uh, in the US. And that's, uh, yeah, the argument that we have to uh, make, make the money back that we spent uh, in creating a drug that really doesn't go there. The same with, uh, with uh, uh, the medication for, uh, for uh, SMA, uh, that's ridiculously expensive. Uh, then I think we've done something wrong as a society. So that is something we need to have a discussion about. Uh, so you, you can definitely not give the responsibility only to the stockholders because that will also lead to extremes. We have to think about that. Um, anyway, with that, uh, Rins had some, some remark that he wanted to make. <laughs> No, just uh, just as a closing remark, tongue in cheek, is that a patent, of course, has to be uh, novel and uh, non-obvious. And this was uh, the title of a, a patent uh, granted in Australia 2001 for a circular transportation facilitation device. Uh, and probably you know where this is heading. Um, but uh, so this is a real patent. Um, and of course, it was for the wheel. <laughs> um, and uh, the guy who uh, uh, filed this patent was later uh, awarded the uh, IG Nobel Prize uh, for, uh, uh, <laughs> for doing this. Uh, and uh, the patent office uh, later, when they found out, quietly revoked uh, the patent. So uh, just as a tongue-in-cheek illustration that there's uh, some things to fix in the patent system. <laughs>